All right, good morning everyone and welcome to another eProm live stream. My name is Devin Struthers. I'm the training coordinator for Psychology Software Tools and today's task is a little bit of a personal one for me. Uh, so it is, for those of you that didn't check out the name of the stream below, um, it's the Psychomotor Vigilance task. Now, the reason why it's so personal to me is just because it's all about sleep deprivation and I'm sure we've all been there. So the point of the Psychomotor Vigilance task is that participants are to see a black background and randomly every two to ten seconds they're going to see a red dot appear on the background now historically this dot is a red led on the screen and obviously we don't have red leds or i mean don't have access to them on a computer in eprime but we'll be simulating uh, a red led and i'll show you guys how to do that but um you know what participants are supposed to do is they're supposed to react to this red led as quickly as possible now this task sounds really easy but it goes on for historically speaking 10 minutes now after that your attention starts to drift and what we're logging here in the psychomotor vigilance task is every time that the participants reaction time to that red dot is or the red led is over 500 milliseconds we're, uh, we call this a lapse now this lapse represents uh, attentional drift or their attention wandering or going somewhere else and and is usually a pretty decent indication of sleep deprivation which, uh, like I said, is something pretty personal to me, um, maybe personal to some of you too. So uh, this one too, one of the reasons why I like this task too, is because it's another one that was requested by a user. So we actually had somebody reach out to us again, say, I would love to see the psychomotor vigilance task in E-Prime. So we're making it today. If you guys have any ideas for experiments you guys want to see, definitely let me know. I'm always able to make experiments based on what you guys want to do. I always want to, you know, kind of tailor these to what you guys are, are interested in. So feel free to leave a comment on the video uh, if you have an idea of a task you'd like to see. Otherwise, um, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So I took a look at this task a little earlier, and it's a little simple to make in E-Prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to spruce it up a little bit, and we're going to make a few extra variables, uh, and we're going to truly randomize the logging with a couple things. We're going to make it a little bit more complex, uh, but it's going to end up being a better task for it in the long run. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the very bare bones version of the task and then after we do that we're just going to build up on it until it becomes a pretty cool task. Now the first thing that I want to do, and I talked a little bit about this in my stream yesterday if you guys were watching, is um, I want to actually use Kronos today. Now I talked a little bit about Kronos, and I got one right here. Um, I talked a little bit about Kronos yesterday mostly because we talked about uh, response latency with the mouse device. Now I said the mouse wasn't particularly great and was uh, subject to large debounce times and that's pretty accurate now since we're looking for uh, responses here that are going to be less than 500 milliseconds that's a pretty small response window so I want a device that's going to have the lowest possible latency for logging those responses that way I don't have any you know I log something as a lapse when it actually wasn't something like that so I'm going to be using the Kronos as my response device today so let's go ahead and just add that to the experiment so to add that what you need to do is go ahead and double click on the experiment object at the top of your structure window click on the devices tab and then just click on add at the bottom now you see our full listing of devices here um, obviously the one that we're going to want today is a Kronos now for those of you who are familiar with adding a device into ePrime you know that a lot of the times if you're adding a response device you have to specify you know hey this is exactly the device I'm looking at you have to point it at an LPT port or a COM port or something like that Fortunately, one of the cool things about Kronos is the device index can be set to next available and it just detects any Kronos that's connected to your computer. That's one of my favorite things about it at least. Um, so I don't have to actually edit anything about the Kronos at all. I can just have, you know, device index set to next available and it'll automatically detect and use a Kronos. So that's something that we definitely want for this. So I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to take a look at my list of devices here. Kronos looks good and all of these look good. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK again. Now let's go ahead and start building the task. And one of the things that historically speaking this task is, is it's, you know, they're either in a dark room or participants are in a dark room or uh, the background of the computer screen is completely black. Now that gets to demonstrate one of the really cool features about ePrime that I've showed off a couple times, but mostly I've just said, oh, look at how neat this is and never actually used it. So today we get one of a you know one of the few really cool uh, excuses to use this really cool feature. Now to do that, let's go ahead and go into Toolbox here because we'll be wanting to change the Toolbox defaults property. And let's go ahead and right-click in Toolbox. Now let's click on the Toolbox defaults button. 
Now, the point of Toolbox Default, since it's been a while since I've talked about this, is it actually gathers all of the objects in your experiment that you might want to add, so all these e-objects here, and if you scroll down, even those slide sub-objects, which is really cool, and it allows you to change all of the default properties of all of these objects. So before even adding them to the experiment, you can already have a few things changed about these objects. And that's going to be really helpful today because I want the background of this entire task to be black to stick with, you know, the, the traditional way that this task is usually run. So instead of having to change every single background in every single object that I add, which is going to take a lot of time and honestly is going to be kind of boring to watch, I'm just going to change them once here and they'll apply to everything in the experiment. So let's go ahead and click on first the text display object. So I'm going to be using a few text displays in here and I want to change this back color property. Now by default it's set to white, which I mean if you've ever worked with ePrime before and added a task event or added a, a, a not task event, a text display object, uh, you know that it just has that white background with a black text. Now I'm going to go ahead and change this from white to black, which happens to be the first thing that appears when you click on the drop down, and that's all I need to do there. Now every single text display I add is going to have that black background. And then I also want to go down here to four color. Now four color by default is also black and in this case might actually end up hurting us because that four color being set to black on top of a black background is going to make your text invisible and you want that text to be visible to participants. So I'm going to go ahead and change that four color from black, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit here to white. Now every impulse of me or every one of my impulses wants me to go ahead and click on that save button but if you do it actually dismisses the dialogue. Um, just know that about toolbox defaults, uh, that if you click save, it'll dismiss the dialog. So make as many changes as you want before actually clicking on save. All right, so not only do we need to change text display, let's go ahead and change feedback display. There's going to be one of those in here. Uh, all right, so what we want to change with feedback display here, there's only going to be one of them, so this isn't as important but we only want the feedback to be on the screen for 500 milliseconds. So we're going to change that duration property there from 1500 to 500. We'll go ahead and scroll down a little bit more and we want to change the slide state because there are going to be a few slide objects in here as well. And we're going to change that back color here from white to black as well. I'm going to scroll down a little bit more and we'll um, add a slide image sub object eventually too. And we'll change that back color to black too. There we go. Click save to save all of those changes. And now most of our experiment should be set up. Now there is one other place you can change the background that not a lot of people really know about in ePrime. And honestly, I don't think I've ever discussed on this channel before. Um, and that's up here. If you go into the experiment object, click on devices, and then double click on this display device, there is this default background color. Now, what the default background color is, is whenever you run ePrime or run an ePrime experiment, you get the startup info prompt in the middle of the screen. This allows you to determine what color the background is behind that startup info prompt. And since everything in this experiment is going to end up being black, we're going to go ahead and change this default background color from white to black. And we'll click apply and OK. So then that way we can just run the experiment. And when we run the experiment, it's just going to show up as a uniform black background especially with the addition of all of our objects. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on the session proc here to open it. And the first thing I'm going to do is I want to add a welcome screen, just honestly like everything or like every other task that we build here. Now the nice thing about the welcome screen in this one is the task is so incredibly simple that you don't really need to have a task, uh, task or sorry, a welcome screen and an instruction screen. Um, yesterday's, if you guys had followed along with the sustained attention to response task, we had a welcome screen and then we also had um, just an introduction or instruction screen. We really don't need that today. Um, I'm just going to throw everything on welcome because literally the instructions of this task are when you see a red dot on the screen, press a button. So I'm going to go ahead and take a text display object from my toolbox. I'm going to drag it and drop it so it's the first object in the procedural timeline here. As always, the name of an object should reflect its function. So I'm going to right click on here, click on rename, and I'm just going to rename this one to welcome and hit enter. All right, so now that I have my welcome object made, let's go ahead and double click on it, and lo and behold, all of our changes from toolbox defaults already uh, applied. So the background for here is white, and if I start typing, it appears in white font there. So this is definitely what we need. 
So let's go ahead and type some very simple instructions. Come to the task. screen. I'll press the center key on Kronos device as quickly as possible. Press any key on the Kronos to begin. There we go. So very simple task. We're going to see a black background. Um, like I said, historically speaking, the task is 10 minutes long, so we're going to make our task 10 minutes long today. And if they see a dot on the screen, they're to push the center key on the Kronos device. And what I mean by the center key, if you don't have a Kronos, is it's just this button right here. Um, there are five keys. It's obviously the one in the very middle. All right, so now that we have our instructions on the screen, let's go ahead and click on the properties page icon in the upper left-hand corner, because we need to do a little bit of tweaking here. We're going to click on the duration input tab, and right now the duration is set to 1,000 milliseconds. Now that is way too fast for participants to actually read all of the text on the screen and click on the Kronos key to acknowledge that they've read it. So let's change this duration from 1,000 milliseconds to infinite. Now my data logging here, I want to change from none to standard. I understand that we don't necessarily need the data for the welcome screen, but it's always nice to have. Now go ahead and click on the Add button in the Device Manager here, or under uh, the Devices part of the Input Mask. So all we need to do now is just add the Kronos device by clicking on it and clicking OK. We can keep our allowable set to any. Correct um, doesn't really need to be set to anything, and we'll keep our time limit and action properties exactly how they're supposed to be. All right, so that is all the changes we need to make to the Welcome screen. So we'll go ahead and click Apply and OK to save those changes and move on. All right, so like I said, unlike yesterday, we're not going to have another screen of instructions because I think they were pretty thorough already. So the next thing we need to do is we need to add the block list. And I mentioned this a little bit in my other live streams too, but if you're curious as to why we do the block and trial and session structure, um, definitely check out some of the other live streams. We do go into a lot of detail with a lot of those. So, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily worth repeating, but just know that that's why we do that and that we do go into that a lot in other live streams here. So I'm going to go ahead and rename my list one object just to block list. Because again, even though I'm only having one trial, I still want that session block and trial structure. We'll go ahead and double click on it to open it in the workspace here. And my procedure for block list is obviously just going to be block proc. And I'm going to hit enter. Again, it says the procedure does not exist. Would you like to create it? I'm going to go ahead and click yes. And if you watch over here in the Experiment Explorer, this little question mark, it's kind of hard to see because it's yellow here, but uh, that little question mark there will turn into a procedure icon. There you go. And it says, would you like to make this procedure the default value for newly created levels? Um, I don't. And the reason I don't is because I'm only just going to have this one procedure on here. Um, so it doesn't really matter if I click yes or no to that, but generally speaking on the block level, you don't want to click yes to that prompt. All right, so now that we're in block proc here, we're going to make another list object, and this, this list object is just going to be called try list. Like I said, this task is, is pretty simple. Um, we're not going to be doing too much, you know, hardcore prime coding until we start beefing it up a little bit later. So we'll go ahead and double click on this trial list to open it in our procedural timeline here. And the procedure we're going to add is just going to be called trial proc. There we go. And I'm going to hit enter. Again, same prompt. It doesn't exist. Would you like to create it? I'm going to click yes. Would I like to make the default value for newly created levels? On the trial level, uh, we, we do recommend hitting yes here. Um, we're only going to have one level of the trial list, though, so it doesn't really matter. Now, the way that I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to make this run for a lot of trials, probably more than E-Prime can feasibly handle in 10 minutes. But we're going to change a property of this that ensures that it runs for exactly 10 minutes. So I'm going to set the weight here, um, let's just say to 100,000. So I have 100,000 trials. That is really the upper limit of how many trials we're going to get. And most participants probably aren't going to run into this. And if you want, you can even make it you know, a million or something if you want, just so there's a, a very large amount of trials. Or if you want, you can make it something like 10,000. 
and then go into the properties page here, click on selection, or sorry, this reset exit tab, and then just make it reset after two cycles or after 10 cycles. And then it's going to run a lot of trials for you. However, what I want to do though, is I actually want to go to this after um, exit list property. And I want to have it exit the list after 600 seconds, which for those of you keeping track at home, that's 10 minutes. So this means this task is going to run for 10 minutes if I click apply and OK. And that's how I want to set this task up. Now I want to have it um, set or have it run in, for 600 uh, seconds or 10 minutes because like I said, historically the task has been run for that long. Now since I have it set up like that and since I have it, you know, set to run for um, 600 seconds, I want to go ahead and add a few more trials to this wait object. The reason I want to add more trials there is just so there's, again, that maximum number of trials that could possibly be run. And then you don't necessarily need to change sequential or random selection since there's only one level anyway. So let's go ahead and jump into the trial proc. Now here's where the more random part of the task comes into play because we don't necessarily want participants to get into a rhythm of knowing exactly when that um, LED or that red dot is going to appear on the screen. That way they don't really have to pay attention, they just get the timing down and start pressing the key rhythmically, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of the task, honestly. So what we need to do is we need to make a randomized variable that determines when the red dot is going to appear on screen. Now to do that, we need to first make our black screen. So just a screen the participants are staring at for the randomized amount of time. And I'm just going to go ahead and rename this one to mask. Now, what I had done while I was talking is I just grabbed a text display object from my toolbox and then dragged it and dropped it to the very beginning of trial proc. And I'm going to go ahead and rename this text display to mask. Um, you can call this whatever you want. Um, I'm just calling it mask. And if I double click on it, it already has all of the properties that I need it to have. It has a black background and no text. However, the one property that I want to change is this duration property. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because this task, at least in the version of it that I saw, um, this black background stays on or is you know continues to not have that red LED show up for a random duration between two and 10 seconds. Now, you can't put random durations in here. You can only pick a static duration. So in order to make a truly random duration, what we're going to do is just a little bit of inline script. So if I take an inline object and put it just before my mask object on the procedural timeline here, I'm gonna go ahead and rename this one and we'll just call it set random duration. There we go, I'm gonna double click on it to open it here. And then let's go ahead and start setting some random durations. So I'm gonna first make a variable, which is where we're going to hold the number that's going to represent our random duration. So I will say dim, and I'm just gonna call it random duration as long. Now I'm calling it a long data type. It could technically be a string and still be okay. Or not a string, it could technically still be an integer and still be okay. But I want it to be a long just in case it picks some really high number. I mean, honestly, the difference between integer and long was way more important way back in the day when computers weren't nearly as good as they are today, but computers have definitely gotten a little better and the use of integer over long isn't as recommended as it was in the past. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to now set the value of this variable that I had just created. So I'm gonna say random duration is equal to, and then now I use the random function in E-prime. So I type the word random and then put this little bracket here. Now, the first number that I write is going to be the lower bound of the random number. So I'm gonna put 2000, because that's two seconds. So the lowest possible number that this random function will ever generate is 2000. And the highest possible number is going to be 10,000. So between 2000 and 10,000 uh, milliseconds, which equals between two and 10 seconds. And since I have this random, uh, random function here, E prime is actually going to give me a truly random number based on the random seed that it picks when I run the experiment. So this is gonna be a little bit better and a little bit more random than had I had like, let's say a nested list in my trial list with a list of durations. That would have worked as well, but now I'm gonna get numbers like 8,426 or something like that instead of just a solid whole number of 8,000 or 9,000 or 10,000. So this is gonna be a little bit better for that, that kind of random aspect of this task. 
So now that I set the random duration variable here, and then I actually have a number associated with it, I have to use it in the duration property of mask. Now the way that I'm going to use it, because I also want to log this in my data, because this is really important, this manipulation here, I want to make an attribute of it. So in order to make an attribute in inline script, you have to do something called a set a trip statement. Now a set a trip statement is, for those of you that aren't familiar with script, literally identical to going into a list object like this and clicking on this add attribute button. You don't need to do this ahead of time. Um, you don't need to, to click on the add attribute button and add it in the list object ahead of time to make the attribute. All you have to do in script is uh, type C dot set a trip. Now I started typing it and you can see the script sense popped up here. So script sense is just our little, um, our little helper dialog. It lets you know exactly what you're doing here and it starts to predict what you're typing. So I typed the word set and Uprime just went, ah, you mean set a trip. It's kind of like, uh, like Google recommendations for answers. You start typing goes, ah, you mean this. So with C dot set a trip here, it says sets the value of an attribute at the current level of the context. Now what current level of the context means is it basically means it's setting that value of that attribute at this level in your data file. So basically, whenever you get your data file, it's going to change on a per row basis. So every trial is going to be different when it runs, and that means that every row in your data file is going to be different when you get this number. So I could keep typing set a trip because it shows me what it looks like here, or if you wanna be a little lazy like me, you can just double click on it and it does set a trip for you. Now, if I hit space and I type uh, a little quote there, another function that we have here comes up called a trip sense. Now, a trip sense just takes a look at all the attributes that you have in your experiment and it goes, do you mean any of these? And don't worry if the attribute that you're making doesn't show up on there. That's completely fine. Um, since we're doing the C.set set a trip statement, we can make brand new attributes like this. We don't have to actually change existing ones. So the attribute that I'm going to call here is just, or I'm going to make here, it's just going to be called mask duration. Now, what, now that I have my c.setatrib statement and my mask duration in quotes there, that means that I have a new attribute already set up. I just set one up. Um, but now I have to give it an actual value. So I have to type comma and then hit space. And then now I have to give it a value. And the value of it is going to be the value of random duration, which is randomly decided right here. So you just type random duration. So now I have an attribute called mask duration that is going to be set to a random number between 2,000 and 10,000 milliseconds. That's perfect. So let's go ahead and use this. I'm going to hop into my mask object. Click on the properties page icon in the upper left hand corner. Go to duration input. And for duration, I'm going to get rid of 10,000. And in square brackets, I'm going to type mask duration. And I'm going to change my data logging here just to standard, but I'm not going to add any input devices. I don't want participants responding during this time. So I'm going to click apply and then OK. And now I have it. Now I have a completely random between 2 and 10 second mask. So the next thing that's going to happen after the random 2 to 10 second mask is that participants are going to see that red dot on the screen that I kept talking about. So let's go ahead and make that. Um, first thing I'm going to do is close all of these tabs up here. Um, it's really cool that you can tab between different parts of your experiment at the top of the window, but I really like to keep that area clean. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Cascade, and then we click Windows and click Close All. And that is so satisfying to watch. All right, I'm going to open up my trial proc one more time. I'm going to take a slide object and put it just after my mask object. And I'm going to go ahead and rename this one to stimulus. So this is now the object that participants are going to be responding to. So this is really our timing critical object here. We need this to show up with the best timing accuracy and we need it to show up um, as quickly as possible and log data as quickly as possible. One of the things that we can do to make sure that there is very little onset delay or delay between when the object should have come on screen and when it actually came on screen is by taking a look at one of the properties of this mask object. If I click on the properties page icon and click on the duration input tab, this pre-release property is the one that I really am concerned about when I am talking about the timing for the stimulus object. Now, I know some of our users do tend to get a little um, confused when it comes to the pre-release property. 
because it actually doesn't improve the timing of the object that it's currently on. It improves the, uh, the timing of the object that comes next in the timeline. So setting a pre-release value of same as duration, which is going to give it the entirety of this mask duration property um, that's going to be randomly chosen, of course, um, giving that all of that duration is going to let E' load stimulus for a very long time. And that's going to give it an onset delay of zero, if not, you know, a very low number than zero. So that's exactly what we need there for that property. If you do have a timing critical stimulus, especially if it's something like a movie or a sound, you know, some sort of media file that may take a little bit of time to load and buffer into the system, you're going to want to make sure that you set that pre-release property to something pretty high. All right, so now that we have our stimulus object up, you can see that the background has accepted our change, of course, and the background here is going to be black, which is, again, exactly what we need here. So now what we need to do is we need to add our little red circle. Now, I cheated and made one in Microsoft Paint a little bit, uh, a little bit before this. So if I go to my experiments here um, and I have live streams, I actually made this task beforehand and I made a little, uh, little uh, picture here called dot. Um, this is going to be our little dot in the middle of the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually copy that and I'm just going to go ahead and save this uh, somewhere that I know that I'll be able to save it. So I'll go into here and my documents, um, I'll put it in my experiments here, and I'll just save it right here for now. So I'm gonna save dot there. Now it's important I know where that dot uh, file is saved because I need to also save my eprime experiment in the same folder. It's gonna make referencing that dot file much easier in eprime and not make me have to write out the whole pathway for it. So what I need to do is I need to click save here before I do anything else. I'll go into the My Experiments folder, and I know that dot lives here. Now, keep in mind, dot isn't necessarily going to show up in this Save As dialog, because right now it's only looking for files of type .es3. And obviously that dot file is going to be a JPEG. It's not a whole E-Prime file, so it's not going to show up in here. But if I hop into my folder, I know that it's here. So this is where I want to save my E-Prime 3 file. I'll just call this one uh, PVT for Psychomotor Vis Vigilance Task. And I'm going to go ahead and click Save. All right, so let me show you what the benefit of actually knowing where that object is and saving this in the same location, especially if we're going to be using a static image, which is going to make this way easier than it would have been before. So let's click on um, anywhere here. Um, so what I did is I added a slide image sub-object just by clicking on its icon in the, the little tray here and then adding it anywhere on the screen. Um, if you remember, we changed the background of these to black, and it looks like that change took as well. And, you know, this is just a really good example of why that toolbox defaults is such a good, you know, really useful thing. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the sub-object properties for this image object. And instead of typing in a file name or an attribute reference, since it's a static image and it's not going to change, I'm going to click on this folder icon here. So now the folder icon actually ends up showing me all of my image files in this. So keep in mind, I now don't see my E-Prime files, but I see my image files. So I have kind of the opposite problem as before. Um, if I want to, I can just make it all files and I can see all of my, you know, I can see everything. Obviously I don't want to load an ES3 file in there. I just want to load my dot. So I will keep my file name as dot.jpg. And like I said, that's really the benefit here of having this in the same folder as the image. Because if I didn't, I would have to make a whole, or write out the whole pathway to this image. Now, I know it's kind of instinct for a lot of users to want to do that anyway in E-Prime. So I can do, you know, C, username, and then like my experiments, and then dot. But what this causes E-Prime to do is it causes E-Prime to have to go to the C drive, then go to the username, and work its way through this entire directory. And if I have dot in here, just dot dot jpeg, instead of that entire full pathway, eprime just goes, okay, it's in the same folder as me, and grabs it much faster. So that's something that's going to be really, really useful for our task later. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, click apply and okay here. And you're going to notice a pretty immediate problem with this. And that is that you see this dot really big on the screen. And obviously this is going to be really, really kind of in participant space and not what we want for this task at all. So what we want to do is we want to click on this properties page icon here. And I want to change the stretch property from no to yes. 
And what it does is it actually stretches the dot to fill the entirety of the little object that I put it at. And the benefit of this is going to be that I can then resize the dot. Now, there is a little bit of a problem with this though, and that's if I go ahead and decide to resize the dot this way, I have an oval and not a dot. So you need to figure out what the aspect ratio of this circle is going to be. Um, and for our purposes today, I'm just gonna kinda eyeball it, but I know that this looks like a good circle to me, but it looks like a bigger circle. So I wanna make sure that it's in that same kinda aspect ratio, but I just wanna make it smaller. And you now, if you really, really care about the size and the aspect ratio of your image, you definitely shouldn't be just eyeballing it like I am now. There we go. And we'll just shrink this just to a little more, because I mean, recall in the original version of this task, this was just a single LED that lit up. So this dot should be pretty small. And what I want to do is I want to put this in the dead center of the screen. Now, I don't want to, you know, I can move it around wherever I want and can kind of guess where the center of the screen is, but I can actually do this for real just by clicking on the Subobject Properties page button. And then I can go to the Frame tab here and I can, oh, it was so close. I can change the X value and the Y value here to center and center. Um, if you've been watching some of these live streams, you know, I like to make a little game out of trying to guess where the center of the screen is. And I was literally 1% off on both of them, which is probably the closest I've ever come. All right, so now that I have that, what I need to do is I need to set up the responses, because that's really the important part of this, is that participants are going to be responding to this object. So I'm gonna click on the properties page icon here, click on the duration input tab. Now the duration for this, I'm going to set to infinite because I want to always log participants responses. I'm gonna set my data logging to standard and I'm going to add my Kronos. Now keep in mind that what I'm going to be logging with Kronos here is I'm only, I only want participants to press the center button on Kronos. Now the center button is going to be logged as a key press of three. And my correct is I'm just gonna keep it at three. And that's gonna be important for our feedback a little bit later. But I know what you might be thinking. How do I know that it's a three? Well, I know it's a three because if I go ahead and click apply and okay, Kronos actually tells you what those buttons are. And it does that by going into the experiment object here, clicking on devices, and clicking on this Kronos button here. Now in Kronos, I can go to responses, and if you see in Kronos responses here, I have one, two, three, four, and five, and it tells these one, two, three, four, and five is actually how you would reference those in the input mask properties of Kronos itself. So if I want to click on the middle button here, I need to reference it as a three. If I want to click on the far left button, it's a one, the far right button's a five, and two and four are in between. So that's exactly what I need. Now keep in mind, this is also useful and, and probably a little more useful, or um, honestly, because you can probably guess just by looking at the Kronos that it's one, two, three, four, and five in the response box. But if you're doing any pseudo button work with Kronos, that's when it's gonna be really, really important. So, you know, how does the photo sensor show up in the response? It just shows up as a C. How do my foot pedals show up? They show up as F and G. So this response uh, tab here is really gonna be important for integrating with Kronos' buttons and pseudo buttons. All right, so it looks like I have this set up exactly how I need to set it up. I have uh, my allowable and my correct. So that is all I need to do to make the bulk of the psychomotor vigilance task. So if I go into my session proc here, I wanna end this experiment the way that I do all of my other experiments. And I wanna add a text display at the very end here. And I'm going to rename this one just to goodbye. Now if I go ahead and double click on it to open it in the workspace, all I have to do is just type a very simple goodbye message, just thank you very much for your participation. And then please let the research researcher know you are done. And let me spell that word right. There we go. Cool. So now that I have my very simple uh, goodbye, uh, goodbye message there, I'm going to click on the properties page icon in the upper left hand corner, click on this duration input tab, and then I'll just keep this up for five seconds. I'll change my data logging here to standard, go ahead and click apply and OK, and I should be good to go. So like I said, that is really the bare bones of what a psychomotor vigilance task needs to be. Uh, you need to have a welcome screen, a goodbye screen, you need to have a random duration, 
of your mask object and you need to have a stimulus object or a red little LED show up in the middle of the screen. That's it. The rest of the task really doesn't need to be set up any more complex than that. But, like I said, I'm only about 30 minutes into the live stream. We have some time. So let's go ahead and beef this up just a little bit. Now, in the psychomotor vigilance task, you're not necessarily concerned with the RT for RT's sake. You're more concerned with the RT in terms of whether or not they have what's called a lapse. So any reaction time greater than 500 milliseconds is considered a lapse. And the psychomotor vigilance task is more concerned with how many lapses there have been. So what you can do is run this task like this. It'll run fine, I promise. And then at the end of the task, then you can just say, okay, we'll go through the data file and we'll count how many lapses there were. But that takes a lot of time. And it's not necessarily something you need to do because you can program that into E prime already. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. So what I need to do is I wanna count every time um, the stimulus object shows up, um, or every time the stimulus object uh, is responded to faster than 500 milliseconds. So what I need to do there is I first need to go ahead and add an inline object just after my stimulus. Now this object is, I'm just going to rename it, I'm just going to call it count lapses. And we'll double click on it in the workspace to open it. Now what I need to do is make something called an if then statement. Now if you were following along yesterday, I talked about how to do some pseudo code to kind of figure out what an if then statement is and how it should be uh, how it should be formatted. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, I definitely recommend it because today I'm just going to kind of go through with the real script for that. So we're going to start an if then statement with the word if and not the word id. There we go. So I'll put if stimulus dot rt. So if the reaction time to stimulus is going to be greater than 500 milliseconds, then. So this means we've officially seen a lapse. So a lapse has happened. So I need to set another attribute or another variable depending on how you want to save this. The way that I'm going to save this is I'm actually going to have a counter that um, counts up the number of lapses and I'm gonna have an attribute that says this was a lapse trial so that they, they lapsed right now. So the first thing I wanna do is to set up that attribute because we already did that a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna do c.setatrib and I'll type lapse trial. And note, I'm going through this a little fast, mostly because we already uh, worked through the c.setatrib statement earlier. So c.setatrib lapse trial, comma, yes. So now in my data file, I'm gonna have a column that'll automatically let me know that my lapse trial, or let me know that this is a lapse trial, or no, it wasn't. I'll just do else if. So else if is a way to extend your, um, to just extend your if then statement. So if I have another clause that I wanna do, and in this case, my clause is gonna be if stimulus dot RT is less than 499 milliseconds, then stimulus, or C dot set a trip, sorry, lapse trial. And you can see there it actually pre-formatted it for me, which was really nice is set to no. And I know I went through that a little bit quickly, so I'll work my way backwards here. So I have an if then statement. If stimulus.rt is greater than 500, then I'm setting the value of an attribute called lapse trial and setting it to yes. And I have the other um, trial here, or the other case. If stimulus.rt is less than 499 milliseconds, then it's not a lapse trial. Participants were actually on it. So C dot set a trib lapse trial is obviously equal to no. And then once you're done with an if then statement, all I need to do is just type the words and if, and I am done. So now in our data file, we're going to get programmatically whether we have a lapse trial or not. And like I said, there was one more part of this that I wanted to add too. I wanted to add whether or not, um, I wanted to add a, a counter to see how many lapse trials I actually have. So to do that, we actually need to start all the way up here in user script. So for our user script, it's where you define something called global variables. And a global variable is defined as a variable that could be accessed by every single level of an E prime experiment. And what I mean by level is it can be accessed by the session proc, the block proc, and the trial proc, no matter what. So if I were to define a variable on the trial proc, 
I can't see it on the block proc or in the session proc. Um, but if I set it in user script, it can be seen everywhere. And that's why I'm setting it, because I'm going to be setting it in the user script as a global variable. I'm going to be using the variable in my trial proc, and I'm going to be printing it to the data file on the session proc at the end of the experiment. So I want to go ahead and just make a variable using a dim statement. I'm just going to call this labs trials as long. Again, I'm just using a long data type just in case because, I mean, if every trial ends up being a labs trial, then this number could get pretty big. So I have my labs trials as long. So I'm going to go ahead and take an inline object and I'm going to put it at the very beginning of my session proc here. And I'm just going to rename this one to init. There you go. I like to start with capital letters here. I'm going to double click on it and I'm going to change init here. Or I'm going to, in my init, uh, inline object, I'm just going to do last trials equal zero. Because at the very beginning of the experiment, you obviously don't have any last trials yet. So now I want to hunt or want to um, want to go down here to count lapses. And I want to actually increment this last trials variable that I had made. So under my c.setatrip statement, I'm going to say last trials equals mouse. Make sure I spell Yep, lapse trials equals lapse trials plus one. And I'm only going to put this inline script here for my stimulus RT is greater than 500. Because obviously, if the stimulus RT is less than 499, then it's not a lapse trial. They actually responded correctly and are actively paying attention, which is exactly what I want. So now that I set the variable, um, or I define the variable in the user script, I set it in my init. Uh, init file error, init uh, inline object, and I'm incrementing it in my count lapses inline object, I need to actually print it to my data file. Now, the way that you automatically print things to a data file in E-Prime is you use the c.setatrip statement. So attributes kind of pull double duty. There's something that you can reference later in E-Prime, and something that actually gets written to your data file, which is really what we want here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an inline object, and I'm going to drag it to just before my goodbye object in my experiment explorer here. I could have also opened up the session proc and just taken it from here and put it right between my block list and goodbye object. Both of those work completely fine. And I'm just going to go ahead and rename and I will call this print lapse numbers. I'm going to go ahead and double click on it to open it in the workspace. So now all I need to do is just a very simple c dot set a trip statement just like we've been doing and I'm just going to call this total lapses and now in our data file this is going to show up as total lapses and it's just going to be the value of my lapse trials so I'm going to go ahead and copy this instead of typing it out there copy just this line and I'll just control V to paste and now I have C dot set a trip total lapses comma lapse trials and that's really all I need now so now I have um, everything that I need to have a more beefed up version of this uh, of this file. Now what I want to do is I want to click on the generate button just to make sure I didn't make any syntax errors and oh no I did. So if I look here I've been using something called lapse trials and if I go into my user script uh -huh, I spelled lapse wrong. So let's go ahead and spell this right. Here we go. We'll click on generate again and that's just a really simple way to fix really kind of easy to overlook mistakes like that, like just a simple typo or something like that. Let's go ahead and close all of those windows. Now the only other thing that I want to do is, if you recall, we're only really working with one button on the Kronos device. We're working with this middle one. And I don't really want participants to have to guess which one the middle button is, even though it's kind of obvious. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up into the experiment object here. We're going to click on the devices tab, and I'm going to double click on the Kronos device. Now I'm going to go over to the LED tab of the Kronos device and this allows you to predefine what the LEDs are going to be whenever the task runs. Now I want participants to press the middle button on the Kronos whenever they see a red LED on the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that button have the red LED appear. So I'm going to turn its current state to on and I'm going to change its color to red. 
and I'm going to click apply and OK. That way there's that visual link to participants that they're going to see a red LED on the Kronos and then that's what they have to click on or that's the button they have to click whenever they see the red LED on the screen. So click apply and OK. I'll save this and give me one second just to plug Kronos in here quick. Plug this. There we go. Plug Kronos in. And we'll go ahead and give this a run. I'm going to run this in windowed mode. Uh, for those of you that need a bit of an explanation about windowed mode or would like to know how it differs from uh, normal E-Prime or running normally, uh, we have a really great video on the differences between E-Prime uh, 3 and E-Prime 2. Definitely recommend checking that one out. All right. Looks like it showed up on my other screen. Give me one second. There we go. Alright, so what I got there was I ended up getting an error called overflow. Now the reason I got an error called overflow is I went a little overzealous with this number of samples that I put in here. As you can see here, it's giving me a set trial list dot reset condition to um, a lot of samples. I went a little crazy with those. So let's go ahead and change these to a little fewer. There we go. I'll just change it to a thousand for now just because I know that's not going to overflow it. So we'll go ahead and click on the um, on the windowed mode button again. Click on test. There we go. And I'm actually going to drag this window over here too. So this window allows us to keep track of the data as we're collecting it. And right now it says welcome to the task, but something you can't see that I'll definitely show you though is if you take a look at the Kronos, we now have our red LED showing up there exactly when participants have to, uh, or exactly where participants have to respond on the Kronos. So now we have our random delay between two and 10 seconds, and there was our dot. Another randomized delay. I'll just run this like two or three times. Because, I mean, especially if they do the upper end of the dot, then that might end up being kind of a long, a long thing there. All right, so let's go ahead and exit this, and let's take a look at our data quick. All right, so in our data file, really the most important thing that we're looking at here is going to be our stimulus. So let's go over here, and as you can see here, stimulus.resp is always going to be 3. And if it looks like, I mean, my stimulus.rt is, you know, just around the 4,000 or 400 millisecond mark which means that I didn't have any of those, um, I didn't have any lapse trials, and let's make sure that that worked well. So I'm gonna go ahead and filter this data because it's kind of a lot to go through. I'm gonna remove all, and I'm gonna look at stimulus RT, and I'm going to look at lapse trials. All right, lapse trial. Now if I did this correctly, these should all say no, and they definitely do. Now keep in mind the reason why the last one here says duration of zero on lapse trial is equal to no, is because that's actually when I exited out of the experiment early. So it's not actually going to give me correct data for this last one. If you run an entire set of this task or run the entirety of the 10 minutes, then you're going to get correct data for all of the columns. The reason that one just shows up weird is because I exited out quick. So yeah, that is all you need to do to make, um, to make this task in E-Prime. So if anyone, oh, somebody has a really good question. Um, thank you for these questions, by the way. Somebody asked, why would my experiment work in windowed mode, but not when I run it in run mode? Now, I mean, I guess that honestly just means, or that really just define, or depends on what your definition of not running is. Uh, and, and that's important too. Are you getting uh, an error when you run? Um, are you getting uh, it's the experiment crashing, anything like that? Um, one of the things that you'll need to check though, and one of the most important properties is going into the experiment object here and clicking on devices and checking, or checking out these display properties. Now, these display properties are really what's gonna be important for a lot of these errors that you're getting if you end up running in run mode or in that test mode that I had showed you, that windowed mode, but not in full run mode. Um, and that could be for a lot of different reasons, but basically whenever eRun runs in that windowed mode, it doesn't run and access the, the computer in the same way that it does when you run full screen. Um, that's why I do it whenever, or that's why this is the mode that I choose whenever I run on these live streams like this, 
because it's something that can be easily shown off and doesn't take over the entire screen, doesn't access the entirety of the video card in the same way. Um, another possible issue may be your video card, and that may be worth looking into as well. Um, it's pretty easy to, to find out. All you have to do is, um, in your little search bar, if you have a little search bar or any other thing, just type in MS Info or just figure out what video card you're using and make sure to update the drivers of your video card. That might help as well. Um, and if you have a more specific error beyond that, we definitely recommend creating a support ticket just by going to support.pscanet.com. There is a whole team of very helpful individuals there, and they're all very happy to help with whatever issue you might have. Uh, so just go to support.pscanet.com, click sign in in the upper right hand corner, and then once you've signed in using a registered email address and password, click on create a ticket, and they're always happy to help. They have really good response times, really friendly individuals. I definitely recommend checking them out. All right, well, if you guys don't have any more questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and say that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for attending. I definitely hope you guys had as much fun as I did. So thank you guys very much. If you guys can think of any other tasks that you would like to see, please feel free to leave a little comment. I'm always happy to help. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, that definitely helps us out, especially from the business end of things. But thank you guys very much, and have a great day.